Welcome to the Cold Spring Oakhurst Consolidated Independent School District Annual Title I meeting. This is a virtual meeting for our parents and family members so that we can go through the requirements of the Title I Part A grant, as well as give you some more information on our participation in the Title I program and how we are utilizing the funds for the Title I program. The requirements are that all schools receiving Title I Part A funds are required to convey an annual Title I Part A parent meeting. The requirements of this meeting is to inform parents and families of their school's participation, explain the requirements of the Title I Part A program, and also explain the right of parents to be involved in this process. So how we qualify for the Title I Part A grant, we actually apply uh, annually for the ESSA, Every Student Succeeds at Consolidated Grant. And a part of that grant is the Title I Part A school-wide program. And it's intended to improve student academic achievement. In order for school districts to qualify for this grant, you have to have a minimum of 40% of the students on the campus that are designated as being from low income families, or in other terms, sometimes it's used as the term of economically disadvantaged. And so what we do as a school district annually is we randomly choose a day when we're applying for this grant, we randomly choose a day to where we can look at how many students that were uh, present as far as an enrollment numbers, and of those students, the percentage of those that are qualified and eligible for uh, free and reduced lunch, which as a uh, district and participating in the CEP program, all of our students actually are on free lunch. So uh, with that said, you can see the percentages for each of our campuses. And we randomly chose the date of April the 6th, last spring, and of that, we had 80% of the students that were in attendance that day at the high school were of low income uh, designation, 70.90% of the junior high students, 67.10% of the intermediate students, and 63.44% of the students were in attendance from James Street Elementary. So as you can see, we meet the requirements of 40% on all of our campuses, which means all of our campuses are actually to participate in the school-wide program. One of the first steps that we convey every year is we conduct what's uh, designated as a comprehensive needs assessment. Uh, what the needs assessment is, is it's a way for us to evaluate our programs and look at the, the needs that we have on each of our campuses in relation to our students' academic performance, and also in relation to the uh, performance on the state mandated assessments, such as STAR and EOC, but not just that, also to look at their academic performance in the classroom based on the Texas Essentials Knowledge and Skills, which is also known as TEKS. Um, also in conjunction with the comp comprehensive needs assessment, we also look to make sure we're meeting the requirements of implementing a school-wide reform strategies that are based on the means to improve an academic, uh, the achievement of our students that addresses the needs of all of our children. So um, we have uh, on each campus, which I'll talk about here uh, in a few minutes, is that we have what's known as an RTI teacher on each campus and a paraprofessional, paraprofessional for RTI, which RTI is for response to intervention. And so those teachers are able to work one-on-one uh, -on -one with those students and those paraprofessionals are able to come and, and work one-on-one -on -one with students that are struggling academically to help them on those specific objectives and uh, learning um, challenges that they may have in uh, whether it be math or ELA and uh, regardless of the content area, uh, definitely give them some uh, extra assistance and provide them with another resource to help them with their uh, academic challenges. Instruction will also be given 
uh, by a staff member who is qualified and certified. And I'll talk about that also here briefly in a little bit about what we have to do if uh, we have a staff member in the classroom who is not properly certified. What are the requirements that we have to do as far as that? We also uh, wanna make sure that we're providing professional development for our teachers and staff. And so professional development is something that we use to make sure that we're helping our teachers and our staff members be on the forefront of the uh, most current instructional methods and strategies and activities that can be used to help our students um, obtain uh, the information, but also maybe receive that information in different uh, ways uh, different formats to help them with uh, their different learning styles that we have. Uh, we also want to make sure we implement the strategies to increase our parent involvement. Um, COCISD, as well as other school districts, st struggle with parent involvement. And this is something that uh, definitely with the pandemic for the, going on now for the last two school years, we've all struggled with because of safety and making sure that, uh, you know, we wanted to keep not have big groups together and and so that's why we have also presenting this um, meeting and training in a virtual format and a recorded format so that uh, for those parents and community members that maybe don't want to attend uh, in person, they have the opportunity to view this information uh, at that time. So uh, also we want to assist our children in the transition uh, to receiving schools. So whether it be our students transitioning from one campus to the other or students that are coming in from other school districts transitioning into our school district, we definitely wanna help with that transition to make sure it's smooth and that those students feel welcome. We also wanna include teachers in the decision regarding the use of assessments. So uh, anytime that there's a new uh, instructional resource program, uh, any type of new method uh, that is used to deliver instruction uh, or measure the student growth using different assessments. Teachers are definitely included in that decision since at, at the end of the day, those are the one, teachers are gonna be the ones in the classroom working with those students day in and day out. So obviously it makes sense that we'd wanna include teachers in those decisions. Lastly, we wanna make sure that we're ensuring students who are experiencing difficulty mastering any of the TEKS, uh, which I talked about earlier, the Texas Essentials Knowledge and Skills, uh, on the state assessments that we want to help them. And so I mentioned uh, briefly about the RTI teacher. And so as we start to look at how we use the funds, one way that we use the funds is to supplement the salary for that RTI teacher on the, each of the campus, as well as any of the curriculum and resources uh, that that teacher needs, as well as having that support staff and that paraprofessional to help assist the teacher so that when students are broken into small groups and to work on specific challenges that they may have, the paraprofessional can also help with those students and uh, have another resource in the room uh, with the RTI teacher. And so it's a really good um, opportunity for those students to receive some individualized uh, support. And so we uh, use the funds for that. We also use it for the different instructional resources and programs, uh, intervention and tutorial programs, or, or we use these funds for that as well, whether it be an after school learning program, whether it be uh, like we had this past summer, we called it Kickstart. It was a, a month long program in the month of July to give students the opportunity to, uh, for those that are struggling to come back and work in a uh, more of an inviting uh, atmosphere it was more of a hands-on activities, more engaging activities, a little less stress, and uh, there was more activities uh, throughout the day for those students to take breaks and to do some non-traditional learning methods uh, every day and when, when you had smaller groups and smaller numbers involved. And then they also took some educational field trips along with that. So looking forward to maybe providing that opportunity again this summer, as well as after school tutoring programs as we move uh, further into this school year. And then we also use the funds for technology and our technology specialist support, which the next slide kind of breaks down a little bit more when we start talking about how much money we have. Our allotment for the Title I Part A this year for the 21-22 school year is $512,074. 
Of that, 463.841 is uh, designated in the line item for 6100, which that is for salary and uh, for uh, basically uh, the staff members on all of the teachers on the campuses that we have for RTI, as well as the aides over at uh, James Street Elementary and Lincoln Junior High. I think we're in the process of uh, trying to uh, acquire an aid for uh, intermediate, but currently those two aides uh, are employed at James Street Elementary and Lincoln Junior High. We also use the funds, we designate money set aside for that when the RTI teacher is out and we have to bring in a substitute to help pay those sub fees uh, for that day. And that 80% of the salary for our COCISD instructional technology specialist is also comes out of that uh, $463,841. $3,500 is also set aside in uh, budget 6200, which is for professional development and technical assistance. And uh, we use those for on site uh, technical uh, training, virtual training, or district wide uh, professional development for all of our teachers and staff. And so we set aside a portion of those funds for that. $45,034 is in line items of 6,300. And those budgets are uh, set aside for supplies and materials. We reserve a portion of those funds for our students that are designated as being homeless. So if there's any resources that those students need or something that we may need to provide to help them with their educational experience, we have a fund set aside for our homeless students. We also reserve some funds for our volunteer program. So if you're watching this and you would like to volunteer, we'll talk about that here in just a little bit on how you can possibly volunteer on your campus. We also set aside money for our parent and family engagement activities. Right now we have our parent and family liaison on each campus and over on the intermediate campus, we actually have several members of the staff over there that are serving on their parent and family liaison committee. And so that is someone on the campus, a staff member, that is the go-between, if you will, to help with all of the parent and family uh, activities that are on the campus to help with the planning and preparation and to help coordinate that and to also make sure our parents and family members feel welcome when they come on campus. Uh, we have several of those members right now that are attending a uh, year-long training that is based off of engaging parents and community members. And so we're really excited that they have that opportunity. And so some of those funds go to that program. I already mentioned the teacher and um, the RTI teacher on each of the campuses and also the instructional technology specialist. So there's funds set aside for supplies and materials and instructional resources that they need. We, uh, all, we uh, pay for our annual uh, Zoom license for the district that uh, we use, which is actually being utilized for this recording. And so we also use that to make sure that we can reach out and have meetings amongst the district, amongst the different campuses, as well as parent and family members can uh, then also participate in some of those meetings virtually. 806 Technologies is the program that we use to house our district improvement plan and campus improvement plans, uh, as well as our Title I uh, parent uh, information and also some of the uh, documentation that we need to keep as far as our Title I requirements. We use some of these funds for our summer school program. We, uh, this past year, we used it to purchase uh, instructional resources and things for our summer kickstart. And so we look forward uh, to offering that opportunity again this year. We, the Success Ed program is the data program that our RTI teachers use as well as our, our coordinator to make sure that they're keeping track of all the students' uh, performance, the students that are, are being uh, brought into the uh, RTI teacher's classroom to look at their academic performance to where we can uh, see that the strategies and the activities that we're using to see how they're making a positive difference or maybe not making a positive difference so that we're able to track that data and see that uh, what we're doing as far as those activities to be able to evaluate that. So that success ed program we use for that. A little over a thousand dollars, 1107 is, is given back to the campuses to be used for improving basic programs. 
So uh, whether they need to purchase supplemental instructional resources or materials or something for the campus to help with the academic achievement of the students, they can use those funds for that. We also have a set aside money for the CNA, which is the campus needs assessment process that I talked about earlier. And then also for our district effectiveness improvement committee, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail here later on that you'll have the opportunity to participate in if that's something that you would like to be involved in. We set aside uh, $20,000 in line 6400, which is uh, the line that we use for our travel and also uh, making sure that uh, our, um, our TI teacher and our instructional technology specialists that they need to travel or go to any professional development opportunities or conferences or trainings that are off campus, so to speak, or that are provided by another vendor, they have the opportunity to do that as well as our parent and family engagement members, those liaison members, as well as any of the parents and family members that would like to participate in a statewide training or statewide professional development, or even the statewide family and parent, get, family, parent and family engagement conference that's going up in December, excuse me, they have the opportunity to pay for that. And so we set aside funds so that those parents can be involved in that uh, opportunity if they so choose. Parents have the right to be involved in their school's program, which I mentioned earlier, talking about the volunteer program uh, gives an opportunity for parents to be involved and participate in their child's classroom. Do you as a parent have the right to observe your classroom uh, that your children are in and the activities that's going on during that uh, classroom time? You can assist in the review and the revision of these policies uh, the school compact, which I'll talk about here in just a minute, the parent and school compact, as well as the Title I plan. You can also serve on the advisory board, as well as the district effectiveness improvement committee, which I'll go into a little bit more detail here shortly. So when we talk about the Title I plan, it's actually how we use the funds uh, here within the school district. One of the requirements of the plan is to incorporate the activities and strategies and the things that we're doing within the district improvement plan, which is the district improvement plan is the game plan, if you will. It uh, correlates with all of the goals of the district, the goals of the superintendent, the goals that the school board has designated as being the um, goals and objectives for the school, for the for the 21-22 uh, school year. The district improvement plan aligns with those. And then it breaks down more in detail about the strategies, activities, and the programs that the district will utilize in order to help accomplish the goals and objectives set forth by the school board. The campus improvement plan is breaks down and, and, and takes that information a little bit deeper. It goes into a little bit more detail with the individual strategies and activities that are happening within the classroom to help reinforce the goals and objectives that the uh, school board has set for the uh, current school year. We also wanna make sure that the plan addresses high quality stu student academic assessments, the supplemental services to assist those struggling students, like I mentioned earlier about the RTI program, the coordination and integration of federal funds and programs, strategies to implement effective parent and family engagement, which I talked about just a little bit a while ago about how we can uh, better help um, invite our parents and family members to different activities and to be engaged and be a part of their students' educational experience. And then last but not least, Title I Part A parents have the right to be involved in the development of this plan, as I mentioned earlier. And so during our district Effectiveness Improvement Committee, when we meet, we definitely go over our Title I plan and definitely want input from all of our stakeholders. And so you as a parent or family member, you definitely have that opportunity. We also talked about a little bit earlier about using the funds for curriculum and programs and resources. And so with that said, all of our grade levels are utilizing what's known as TEACH resources. And what it is, is it's a curriculum alignment to make sure that all of the TEKS and our core curriculum classes are all being uh, covered and making sure that our teachers are following a sequence to deliver that information so that it makes uh, sense to our students and it goes along through the learning process. We also have learning resources available for our students, uh, specifically in ELA and math uh, through the K through eight level. And that is a program known as iStation. Some of you may be familiar with that. 
You may have even seen some of the data reports from the ICIP uh, data of your students, uh, looking at to where they began the year and to how they progressed throughout the year and how they've grown uh, through the year, either through their reading and writing and or math uh, scores. We also want to make sure that our achievement levels on the state academic standards, uh, which will be released this uh, later in October, I do not believe the district will be rated because of the COVID-19 pandemic this year, but they will release the uh, results of the STAR and EOC uh, academic performance of our students from the past 2020-21 school year. And so those results will come out to the public later in October. And then looking forward to the STAR and EOC testing calendars, those will be taking place in April and May of 2022. So it seems like a long way away, but it's really just right around the corner. Uh, talked about a while ago, the parent and family engagement policy. And so each campus, uh, when you're looking for the parent and family engagement policy, each campus underneath the uh, campus website, under the parents tab, you will find the parent and family engagement page. And once you access the parent and family engagement page, you will see the parent and family engagement policy for your campus located at that location. If you're looking for the district parent and family engagement uh, policy, you will find that underneath the families tab uh, when you go onto our district homepage and click on the family engagement page. And then directly on the family engagement page, you will see the COCISD parent and family engagement policy. I talked about also a while ago that parents have the right to be involved in the school parent compact. The school parent compact is a written agreement. Basically, basically if you can think about it as a document that's folded in three different partitions, a trifold, if you will. And on one of the uh, folds, you will have all of the information that uh, parents are responsible for and how parents can be involved in the learning process. The uh, middle portion may have what the teachers will be responsible for and all of the information that the teachers will be, uh, you know, helping with and the academic uh, performance and achievement of the students. And then the third tab, obviously, is our students. It will show the responsibilities of our students and what our students can be uh, particularly involved with to help with their academic achievement as well. And so this agreement is uh, developed in cooperation with our school staff, our parents, and our students at the secondary level, which our junior high and high school students definitely have the opportunity to participate in that compact to uh, be able to voice their opinion as far as what they will be responsible for. So uh, during a parent-teacher conference, you should have the opportunity to review the school parent compact for your campus, and if that's something that you can contact your campus administration, they should be happy to be able to share that information with you. When we talk a little bit more about the School Parent Compact, it stresses the importance of the communication between school and home and the value of the parent-teacher conferences and how they play an important part uh, in the academic performance of our students. We know in the last couple of years with COVID-19, it's been very challenging to have those parent-teacher conferences but I know several of our teachers have performed parent-teacher conferences virtually, either using uh, Zoom or Google Meets or some other type of virtual platform to allow you still have that face-to-face -face connection to be able to communicate back and forth over uh, what your student is doing in the classroom and to possibly you know, collaborate on some of the things that can happen at home to help reinforce what's going on in the classroom. And those parent-teacher conferences are required by law at the elementary level. So uh, those are some things that we want to make sure that everybody's aware of about the parent school parent compact and that you have the right to be involved with the development of that agreement as well. We also, by law, have to set aside 1% of our funds of our allotment when we receive over an allocation of $500,000, 1% must go to parent and family engagement activities. And so for us this year, that would be $5,120 is set aside for parent and family engagement activities. And earlier on the slides, if you recall back, that's a little over $1,700 per campus to be utilized 
for parent and family engagement activities. And so I had mentioned earlier about our parent and family liaisons on the campuses going through a year long training to help with our parent and family engagement process, as well as if you would like to participate in any of the statewide trainings or the statewide conferences coming up in December, feel free to reach out and we can make uh, that happen. Just let us know. And I, my contact information is coming up here shortly. And so you'll be able to just give me a call and we can, we can definitely help you navigate through that. Also, I talked about earlier, parents have the right to know. Schools are required to notify parents that a student has been assigned in any classroom for more than four consecutive weeks if the teacher in that classroom does not meet the state certification requirements. As we talked about, Title I Part A, you have the right, uh, and us as a district, we need to make sure that the teachers in the classroom are properly certified and qualified to be there. Unfortunately, the COVID pandemic, one thing that has taught us this past year is that the teacher uh, industry, so to speak, has definitely suffered tremendously, uh, not just Cold Spring Oakhurst Consolidated Independent School District, but I know several school districts that are still challenged with trying to find qualified and certified teachers to be in the classroom. And so with that said, we do have over on our high school campus, um, I believe it's two teachers or possibly three, uh, I think it may be three over there that are not currently certified for the program that they are in the classroom for. And so I know uh, the high school administration has sent out that uh, letter, which is what we require by law to notify that we do have staff members that are hired in those uh, classrooms. And it does designate what subject area and content we're talking about in that letter. And it was sent out to parents. I believe we have one a staff member over at JSE or James Street Elementary that is certified. The teacher does have a certification, just not the early childhood certification, maybe for the pre-K or kindergarten class, but they do have a certification for uh, grades, um, you know, maybe one through one through eight. They just don't maybe have the certification. So I believe they're working on getting certified, but by law, we also have to send out that notification because they are currently not certified in the class that they are currently assigned to. Uh, Every Student Succeeds Act, that program also requires that we do an annual evaluation. And one of the best evaluation tools that we have is to get feedback from you, the parents and guardians and community members. So we'll be sending that survey out uh, this November. I will release it right at the end of November. It will be when we come back from the Thanksgiving break, but I'll send that out. It'll be on our website. It'll be on our Facebook page and our other social media platforms. And we always look forward to the feedback from our stakeholders and getting feedback and, and uh, the comments that is included in there. Because what we do is we use this information during our January District Effectiveness Improvement Committee. And so we want to have all of that uh, comments and have the survey and that survey will close on uh, December the 18th, which is actually a Saturday. And so I will wait till that Saturday afternoon to close the survey so that we can gather up all the feedback and information. And then that will be uh, disseminated out to our, our January District Effectiveness Improvement Committee. So if that's something that you would like to be involved in, we'd certainly love to have you serve as a member of this committee so that you can help us in guiding the decisions of not only how we use our Title I Part A funds, but also the programs and instructional resources and those things that we are doing on a daily basis to help guide us in a direction to help with our student academic performance, as well as also to help us start planning for the 22-23 school year. I know we're only in October right now. That sounds like a long way away, but it'll actually be here really before you know it. And so uh, we meet three times a year. We meet in October, which we'll be meeting on the 29th of this month. We'll meet in January and in June as well. And so we have faculty members and staff members uh, on that committee. We love to have our parents and family and community members and our represent, represent, representatives from our business and industry partners as well. And then at the secondary level, we also uh, enjoy to have the opportunity to have our students from junior high and high school serve on this committee as well. Because at the end of the day, this committee is all about our district and improving our district and the effectiveness of our district. 
But what it's really all about is what we can do to help our students. And so it kind of goes without saying we should have student representation on this committee. And so we definitely look forward every year to having those students uh, serve on this committee and to hear their voices as well. And so as needed, we will have additional meetings. Uh, hopefully we can get back to a more a more normal schedule this spring and uh, have a, a Title I update parent meeting this spring and uh, to where we don't necessarily have to worry about COVID as much anymore. Maybe we can start getting back to more of a normalcy. I know that uh, we've been trending in the right direction as far as our, our um, infection rates here within the district here lately. And so that's all positive and we're looking forward to that. But hopefully we can actually start having more face-to-face -face meetings in the future. If you have any questions about anything that I've discussed today, or if you want to have some more information about our volunteer program, or if you want to have an opportunity to serve on a district effectiveness improvement committee, feel free to give me a call at 936-653-1175. My name is Jeff Eichmann. I'm the special programs director here for COCISD, and I've thoroughly enjoyed the opportunity to visit with you today. And so if there's anything ever we can do, feel free to give me a call. I thank you for your patience. I thank you for your uh, participation. Thank you for uh, allowing me to bring this information to you in a non-traditional format. And so once again, thank you for all that you do. Thank you for uh, your most precious prize if you're interested in with us on a daily basis. Thank you.